dancing starts with a heartbeat. It is within us. At 16 weeks, when we are in our mother's womb, we start reacting to sounds, and we even jiggle to the music our parents may be listening to. So basically, at 16 weeks, our dance career begins. <laughs> As toddlers, we are the super keen dancers. <laughs> we are the first one to jump onto the dance floor and to drag our parents to dance with us. <laughs> you might recognize yourself here. At school, <laughs> at school, we refine our skills. We memorize steps. We develop proprioception, which is understanding our, our body into space. And we might even develop our own dance style. But come 13, and by then, 90% of us have retired. <laughs> so, why do we retire? Because we become self-conscious, and we don't want to look like a fool. Or maybe a teacher said, sorry, but dance isn't for you. So somehow, dance is cast aside in our society. It remains backstage. The way we talk about dance is that it's a great hobby, but not a good career choice. If you're a boy, you get teased to go dancing. And I heard so many times, especially in England, I do need a few drinks before I get onto the dance floor. <laughs> so I am a dancer. And when I say this, people think about ballet. Now, ballet was invented 500 years ago, and I truly believe that as a species, we've been dancing for much longer than that. So it seems that we have forgotten what dancing truly means to us. From dancing every single day in our early years to now sitting at the desk most of our days, aren't we all bubbling inside to unleash our inner dancer? <laughs> what are you afraid of, Erica? <laughs> so tonight, I will delve into some of the observations I made through my personal journey on what it truly means to dance. So maybe tonight, you can apply or take away some simple steps on how you can embed it into your life. When I was three years old, I was obsessed with dancing. <laughs> I dreamt of dancing, and all I wanted to do is dance. Between the age of six into 13, I entered ballet competitions. And what I realized is that I did not have the typical ballerina body. I did not have the arch foot. I did not have the willowy figure, the open hips, or the flexibility. But that did not stop me, because I knew there was not one way of being a dancer. And I found contemporary dance. Now, contemporary dance is rooted in ballet, jazz, modern dance. But what it offers that suited me really well, and for those who are in the room that knows me, it offers creative freedom. <laughs> and you know how much I love improvising. So I found contemporary dance. And it was obvious that I was going to, get a going to become a professional contemporary dancer. I was going to get onto this renowned conservatoire or dance school and do what I love doing, dancing. So I applied three times in a Paris conservatoire, two times in a Lyon conservatoire. I applied in Rennes, Angers. I went to Lausanne and Brussels. And throughout all these years competing and auditioning, I never quite made the final cut. If there were five spaces, I was usually number six. By the age of 18, I failed at every single audition. But still, it did not stop me. What it taught me is that I might not fit the mold, but it taught me resilience. So I moved to Paris. And I studied privately with all the teachers that I aspired to, to be taught by. And I looked towards London. And I was accepted at a master's in choreography. Finally, I could dedicate a whole year into dancing 
I had a million ideas that I wanted to try. And I can tell you, it was the best year. I did every single project that, were, that was coming into my way. I directed music videos, I collaborated with other people in the masters, and I traveled to perform. It was the beginning of my freelance choreographic and performing career. Five months after I graduated, I got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. My pancreas had stopped working. And if you don't know what diabetes is, it's an autoimmune disease that means I have to wear an insulin pump and a glucose monitor. So I can avoid going too high or too low. I can tell you the highs are not the fun ones. <laughs> I will always remember coming back after two weeks at hospital and sitting in my home in front of my computer and there was nothing. Nothing I could think of. I was completely numb. But what that did to me, as I was facing this fig fog, <laughs> was pretty, pretty, pretty white. And I, up till now, I could see the next steps I could do, but there I was facing this fig fog, not knowing where to go next. But what it did, it made me be in the present moment. I had no other choice. The diagnosis meant major life changes, and health became priority number one. So I took a few months to adapt, maybe years if you look at it, but, um, but I took some time to adapt to the new condition. And that made me consider and reconsider how dance, the one thing that was nourishing me, and how it could fit into this new life. And I thought hard about what could I do with my, with my skills. So I looked into other areas in life because an erratic freelance choreographic and dancer lifestyle is, was not really on the table at that time. So I looked at other areas of what I could do. And dance is not reserved for the stage or the studio. But where I believe it dies the most is in the office. In the office, we stop, we stop moving. And when we stop moving, we basically live in our heads. So five, year, five years ago, I started coaching entrepreneurs, individuals, and teams on how they can move and find their way of moving so they can feel more relaxed, more confident when they are speaking in public like this, <laughs> when they're in front of a camera or pitching investors. And I called myself a movement coach. People were like, what is this? <laughs> well, come and try it. But, but basically, people came and, and to see me, and they were fidgeting a lot. They were like, what is this? What do I do with, with this stuff? I start speaking, and they just flap around. Or I can't breathe when I'm in, in front of, a, of my team, etc., etc." So what I realized doing this work is that we, we basically live in our heads. And when we live in our heads, our body start doing its own thing. It's like, all right, I'm not part of the conversation. I'll start doing whatever I need to. And that's why we fidget. So if you fidget, flap your hands or put your hair or fiddle, fiddle with your fingers, this is your inner dancer knocking at the door, a bit like the genie in a bottle, being like, hey, I'm here. But what do we do? We're like, no, don't move. We stop moving. When we restrict our movements, we lose our flow. So when we move consciously with our whole body, when you know right now where your feet are, where your hands are, where your heartbeat is, you find your own flow and you become a lot more present. So just move. <laughs> and I see my clients as dancers because they work hard at recreating the neural pathways between what's going on in the brain and what's going on in the body. So everything is connecting and everything is aligned again. They are finding their own ways to move so they can speak authentically. And through working with uh, and coaching people, I ended up working 
for a refugee organization mm -hmm. helping women refugees settle in the UK. Was it there? Yes. And something incredible happened for the first workshop that I was with these women. Mostly BAME women and having lived in the UK for very different, different times, but pretty recent. And I was there, they like today, in a church hall, and they were all facing me in a circle, and I was explaining what we were going to be doing. And something quite wonderful happened, and a bit odd. They started copying every single of my moves. And it threw me off a little bit, because it was the first time I was working with refugee women. But I understood that that was their way to be part of it. That was their way to connect with me. That was their way to understand what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> and <coughs> throughout the workshop, I tried to speak less, and I tried to move more. And at the end of the workshop, there were some tears, but tears of joy because we were able to connect and be together without tension, without judgment, without fear of being misunderstood or not accepted. And we even barely knew our names. So for a little moment, as we, to we took a big, big hug circle at the end, we took a big deep breath to mark the moment. And them as much as me, we felt like we could connect beyond words. And for a single moment, we all belonged. After I was uh, reflecting on this quite pivotal moment for me, I realized that, obviously, it hits me, nonverbal communication is the first tool we have as human beings to connect to others pre-language. When we <coughs> move and when we dance together, we start having a complete different relationship to our environment and to others. So this was a pivotal moment for me because I started teaching dance to asylum seekers and to refugees. Because I saw firsthand how moving and how dancing with a group helped people regain self-esteem. When we move and when we dance together, it doesn't matter which language we speak, which religion we believe in, what our sexual preferences are, or how much money we have in our bank account. We cannot deny that we all belong to this earth. And when we move together, <coughs> there is no more wall and no more frontiers. So no wonder why I'm not very creative when, when I'm in between four walls. So I recently moved to Norfolk and I found the forest as a creative sanctuary. I need space, <laughs> I'm a dancer, I need nature and I need silence so I can tune into the inner rhythm of my heartbeat, my own tempo and my inner dancer. And I call this forest dancing. I, j I invite you to all join me. <laughs> um, but when I go forest dancing a couple hours a week, I let my body go wherever it needs to go. So sometimes I climb trees, sometimes I cover the whole forest, and sometimes I stand still. I scare dogs, <laughs> and, walk <laughs> and walkers pretend not to see me. <laughs> But what I do is that I reconnect. <laughs> I reconnect with myself and with my inner dancer, and I rebalance. So you may be quite excited to see how it looks like. So I choreographed, especially for tonight, a little experimental video where you can have a, a bit of an idea. It will give you an idea of what it looks like. <laughs>
Okay, so I'm guessing on Sunday we're all going to wear glittery dresses and dance in the forest, <laughs> right? That's the plan. <laughs> so if you want to start moving and start incorporating a bit more movement into your day, if you feel like you're sitting down too much, um, I have three things for you. And don't worry, nobody will know. So as soon as you get up, instead of going into your phone and checking your emails and Twitter, etc., just take five breaths and move with these five breaths. When we move and we breathe, we release tension. So you can breathe in and breathe out and do this five times and you will be a lot more present during your day. Otherwise, for the playful people, <laughs> use your surroundings. So I love pattern, but I think as we walk to, to the office or as we walk back home, I'm sure instead of looking at our phone and our head down, we could look at what's going on on the floor and just use the lines and walk on the line or avoid the lines or have one foot on the curb and one foot on the road and have this very jazzy <laughs> disco, <laughs> disco stride. But be playful with your environment and you'll see that nobody will see what you're doing. You will be in your own little world and you will be present with your surrounding. And my third option, <laughs> If you find yourself in an empty carriage like myself this week, um, but you can do this in the comfort of your own home or once there is nobody else in the office anymore, just get up and or stay seated if you, if you prefer, but you can just let go and move. <laughs> and if you need a little help, just press, the ra press, press play on the radio. Even my introverted English husband do this in our kitchen. <laughs> So never lose hope. <laughs> but it's to be said that just listen to your heartbeat and let, let the, the body move the way it needs to move. And just let the, the, the inner dancer be released. So to finish, for me, being a dancer, start by being in a moment, start by expressing ourselves non-verbally, start by listening to our inner rhythm, and is to let our inner dancer lead us. We may have stopped moving when we were in our early years, or at 13, and we now wait for the weddings, the New Year's Eve parties, or the festivals to shake our body, but the inner dancer is always there, and will always be. There is no one way to be a dancer. There is no one way to dance. We are all dancers because we are all alive. When there is a beat, there is dance. So let your body take you there. Thank you. Thank you.